Very excited because I see her smiling there and I'm like, <laughs> I'm just very excited. Uh, welcome to Meet the Biz. We have a woman here, an artist who, I mean, she's been in so many of my favorite films of all time. Uh, I mean, I could list the classics she's been in. Carrie, the original, Dress to Kill, um, uh, the Robocop series, uh, one of my favorites, Blowout, uh, 1941, I Want to Hold Your Hand. I mean, she is a definition of a star. And not, not just on the silver screen. She's a star in the way she is leading her life and through the years of We Spark, which we will get into. I'm gonna bring her on now. And I'm like a little teared up here. This beautiful woman, Nancy Allen. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. And thank you for that fabulous introduction. Oh, really well, appreciate it. thank you for your fabulous life. <laughs> thank you. I, I, I wanted to start off, I mean, I wanted to thank you for all the joy and healing that you have brought to so many, not just through your um, work at We Spark, but through your work as an actress and a humanitarian. What, what, is, what is your biggest joy in life? I would say the people in my life, really. I mean, it really is. I just love, I, I love my friends, my family, and uh, mostly my family of friends because my family's uh, mostly gone. Um, and I guess, you know, I love, I've always loved movies. I've always loved movies. That was truly my first love, even as a little girl. Yeah. And the fact that, I was able to do the work that I did and um, entertain people. People seem to really, people are still talking to me about these movies and it's quite a long time ago, you know? So that they've, and I, I love, I really love when I meet people who've seen the films and they love to tell me about the first time they saw the film and what it meant to them. And, you know, to realize that again, you've connected with people through your work. So I love that. And um, for someone who was a very shy, very, very shy little girl, you know, it's um, it's a big deal to say that my greatest joy is to connect with people because I was probably <laughs> like, don't talk to me, you know? That's so, funny. <laughs> so well, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting too. I mean, as in Carrie, I mean, you didn't play that shy girl. You played the... Um, the B-I-T-C, you know, H. <laughs> I did. How do you get as an actress to those parts of you and bring it out? Mm -hmm. Or how do you get those different kinds of roles? Well, you know, um, I think, it, again, I go back to my childhood because I, being that shy little girl, I, and I had, I actually said I had a sort of disruptive home life. I'll just say, put it that way. Yeah. that I spent a lot of time in fantasy, a lot of time in, you know, like I said, movies and 
you know, uh, creating even with kids at school, you know, instead of we weren't jumping rope, I, you know, you create a scenario, you be this and you be this. And I kind of lived in fantasy a lot. And um, having done that, it's a very more comfortable for, for me to go in than to go out. So to have a role that was like, oh, that's more comfortable than being me. Now for that particular character, um, you know, when you read something and initially, I mean, you have to like a character. You have to like a character right. to play them. You can't go, I hate her. You know, how do you bring life to it? So the way I looked at it was um, she wasn't so bad and somebody did something, you know how teenagers are, oh, you know, yeah. teenagers like very black and white with things. And I thought, well, somebody ruined her party. Somebody ruined her fun. And that's not nice. And that's not fun. And you know, and I'm, she's going to be sorry, you know, very kind of childish approach to it. And, um, you know, just give yourself, I gave myself permission to be mean. I certainly had enough examples of my life in my life of people being mean. And I don't like that. I don't like meanness. It really, really hurts. It hurts my heart. Yeah. But, um, I was so shy and that when we started these rehearsals and I was just in character when we were doing the rehearsals that no one talked to me for about two weeks. <laughs> it's like they thought I was that person. Yeah. So I think, you know, we all have, um, you know, we're complex. Human beings are very complex. And I think I've certainly had resentments towards people. I've certainly disliked I don't like to use the word hate but really dislike someone and would like to have said or done something so I think you just have to kind of call on that mm -hmm. and sometimes find that person who you are talking to who you'd like to say that to and you know uh and do it that way and it's fun it's fun you can be bad with no consequences what's wrong with that <laughs> you know? right, right. Well, and it, it, the thing about your work too, uh, what's so wonderful, it has so many different levels. So even though somebody is that, that mean girl, you could see the pain within her underneath and, and you show that even if it's, oh. so that's what's so wonderful about your performances. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, do you have a favorite, I know this is, I, this is probably a stupid question. Do you have a favorite performance or a favorite character that you've done? You know, everyone asks that because I think it's a fair question. Um, you know, I certainly love Chris from Carrie because it was my first significant role. Um, I love uh, Liz in Dress to Kill because the role was written for me. So it's very special. Yeah. Um, I love Anne Lewis because, I mean, who wouldn't want to be Anne Lewis after I played? It was like a new role, a powerful woman, yeah. someone you really hadn't seen before in film. So I, I love and admire her. Plus, my father was a cop. But I think I, I'll, I'll, at the end of the day, I always end up at blowout because I, I truly love that character. And I didn't like her at all when I read the script. I thought she's she's weak, she's this, she's, I mean, I just, and I had to find, I had to find a way to fall in love with her, to play her, and ultimately I did, and, you know, one of the things I decided to do with her, I like a character that has some sort of arc, mm. uh, you know, it's a shift, but also I wanted her to have a dream, I wanted her, you know, when she talks about what does she want to do, she wants to do makeup for movies, well, we know she's never going to do this. We know that. But she has that dream. And I think as human beings, we all need to have some hope and, and, uh, and dreams ahead of us. And to be honest with you, who knows? Maybe we'll all achieve all of our dreams. I, you know, anything is possible. So I think yeah. because of those reasons, I did fall in love with her. Uh, I did. The, the way when you said that, it sort of, it even touched my heart because that's, uh, not not just one of your favorite performances, but one of my top 10 movies of all time. In fact, oh. I watched it last night and it just, I mean, the intricacy of the film and and the music and the characters and without, I'm not going to say what happens, 
but it's just it's just so amazing so it even adds to me when I ever I do watch it again um to know that 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 was so full for you so. oh yeah and uh yeah I was never going to do the film because I had a, a rule Brian De Palma and I were married at the time and I had just done Dress to Kill so I always wanted to try and do something you know not related to him in between and um as it turns out, uh, there was a particular list of actors and actresses to play uh, Sally and Jack, although her name wasn't Sally, it was, I think it was Kate. And I said, no, 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 she's not Kate, she's Sally. <laughs> you know, can't be Kate, it doesn't work for her at all. But um, John Travolta was never meant to play that role. He was never on the list to play that role. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was John Hurd, it was uh, Jimmy Woods, it was sort of more, you know, because John Travolta is such an emotional and human kind actor. These were much more cerebral actors as, as it was written. And they were supposed to be a little older, and a little more cynical and, and like that. And um, it just so happened that uh, John had called Brian and just chatting and said, oh, what are you working on now? He says, oh, I had the script. And he said, can I read it? And when Brian told me, I said, well, what are you going to do if he liked it? He says, oh, he's going to see that it's not for him. I said, you know, I don't know. I'm not so sure. And sure enough, he said, oh, I really want to do this. And I said, well, OK, OK, all right. Well, we're going to do it. And he said, and John would love it to do it with you. He said, I asked him who he would like to work with. And he loved, we loved working together in Perry. Yeah. So this was a great opportunity for us to uh, reunite. And so, so. So the backstory being that the characters were written in a little different way, we had to come together and um, John and I had to, Ryan gave us some scenarios, we had to do some improvisation to find who these characters were for us. So yeah. we would record that and then take notes from that and then rework the script so that it really fit who we were and who we were together. Yeah. That was fun. I love that. And I love how you brought these two actors again together for another piece. Um, yes. It began with a sound that no one was ever supposed to hear. Yes, he says he pulled the girl out of the car. I would like you to forget about her. Yeah, that's what I heard just before the tire blew out. You're right, it was a shot. He recorded a murder. They say it never happened. Still loose ends, witnesses. The girl, I've decided to terminate her. Terminate her. Terminate her. Brian De Palma's blowout. Now you hear it. Now you don't. I could, uh, I, uh, this is, <laughs> I could keep on going. What, what is one of the most, what is what is one of the biggest lessons that you've learned in your Hollywood journey? Oh my goodness, that's a <laughs> well. First of all, you have to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. That's the first thing. Because I was certainly not encouraged. You know, it was like 
my sister, my daughter, my sister, my daughter, my mother was like, you can do anything. And my father's going, well, what makes you think you can do that? Do you know how many people want to act? You know, it was, it was, it was that kind of, I had very, very mixed messages, but it was my dream. And, um, you know, and I, I could see myself. It's like, you have to, I believe you have to see yourself doing something before you do it. So I really could see it and it really didn't seem like a no to me. I didn't see the no. Yeah. And um, so believing in yourself and following your path. Uh, when I came here, I'd been doing commercials in New York, you know, television commercials in New York for about 10 years. And I thought, well, I've sold everything else. Yeah. I don't know what else I can sell if I don't make the move now. So I had the, a list of um, five agents to call. And I, there were, out of the five, one of them was a woman. And so I thought well, I'm calling her first because I think women are nicer people. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> it was a big surprise. Uh, I spoke to her and she says, oh yes, I got your picture. And, and she said to me, well, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 25. I looked young. I looked about 18. She said, I'm 25. She says, you're too old. Go back to New York. She said, you wouldn't even be worth the investment of my time. If you were a man, maybe. And I got off the phone. I was, first of all, stunned. And then I thought, well, you know what? I'll show her. And though the languor was good for me, it spurred me on a little bit. So believe in yourself. Take the initiative. Don't be afraid to ask, call, do whatever. I mean, I look at some of the things that I did. I can't even believe I did them for someone who was really shy. I who did that? But so, you know, take the initiative. Follow your dream. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do something because I don't, I just don't believe in that. Um, what else? Um, do your homework. You know, if you're going to do something, do your homework, do your research. Um, pay attention, pay attention. I'm a big people watcher. I think that's been better than the acting class in some ways. I mean, I love the acting classes, sort of, but um, <laughs> I, I love watching people. And I did so from the time I was a child, so much so that my mother would say, stop staring. You know, yeah. you know, stop staring. So, you know, observe, be, a, be an observer in life. Yeah. Um, learn to listen. Listening is, does 50% of the job for you, you know, as an actor. It's like, just instead of thinking of what you're going to do, if you're really listening, if it's written fairly well, you're going to know how to respond. You're going to emotionally know how to respond. Yeah. And, um, you know, work hard. Yeah. I don't know. Work hard. You know, don't do anything half measures. If you're going to do it, go for it. You know, just go for it. And uh, if it's an acting thing, you know, you'll be reeled in by someone to say, we'll try it a little bit this way. Yeah. I don't know if you have any writers here, but if you're going to write, write it all. You can always be, cut it back. You know, I just think you have to know that what you have is different than what anybody else in this world has. Your life experience is your greatest asset. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I want to bring on a, a couple of the students to, because I know they have questions. We have uh, Shannon Dierix here, and uh, I know she sent in a question. Hi, Shannon. Hey, I do have a question for you. Um, what is it like to be on Touched by an, an Angel? Oh, you know. I love that question because it was one of the most beautiful experiences in my life. And I'll tell you why. Um, I was hired for that. And it was a really nice part. I liked the part, complicated character. And the day that I was packed and ready to leave for Utah, I received a phone call that my brother had died. And I was obviously in shock and I had to do a fly, fly, fly somewhere, do something. And I called my agent. I said, you know, I'm, I, I, can't, I can't, I have to go here and I have to do this. And I wouldn't even. So anyway, they said, could you be there? I was supposed to be there Thursday. Could you be here by Sunday? And I thought, well, I guess I could. And they said, well, wait for you. So I arrived on that Sunday, having, my, having just lost my brother 
And let me tell you something, there was no better place that I could have been with kinder, more loving people. Um, Della Reese was just, she just would hold me in her arms and she said, you go ahead and you cry and she'd hold. I mean, it was just a very loving atmosphere. Uh, I have high, high respect for um, people who do uh, series television work, especially hour long. It's so hard. The hours are so long and they just have to keep producing and keep producing. So um, I would say because they were very loving and kind, first of all, to me, I loved it. I loved the character. We had a terrific director. Roma Downey is a wonderful actress. Stella Reese is a kick. And um, uh, Brooke Adams, I'd known before and worked with. And I mean, we just um, we just had a really good time. And, and uh, it was a high quality production. So I have nothing but good memories of that experience. Thank you for that question. Okay. Ah, uh, thank you for that answer. Well, uh, it it um, it really is something good to. I mean, it's to take in what you just said because we all have uh, our work life and our life life, and you know, usually they're intersecting each other. But something like that, it just shows that we move on we have to move forward even though we have grief at moment and this and that and what a perfect show for you to be on touched by an oh angel. oh my god totally and you know there was a it, it's so funny how things work there was an aspect in this role where there was some grief because she had to let go of this relationship with uh and so to be able to really i had that that resource in that moment to bring up you know that that sense of loss and sadness uh, that came with it. So, but, uh, and Roma shared with me, she had lost her mother at a really early, I mean, so it was, you know, if you are open, if you're open to people and let people come to you and share with you, I really think we, you know, we all, I don't know. It was just, it was just a beautiful experience, really beautiful experience. Wow. Um, I, you know, on my notes, I wrote old soul because I, I, I watched one of your interviews and you brought up old soul. What is your definition of an old soul? <laughs> you know, I guess it's, it's someone with, in a way, a lot of wisdom to begin with. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I believe in, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. How would I know? Uh, you know, we don't know these things. We're just mere mortal mortals, you know. But, <laughs> but an old soul, I said, someone with a deep understanding who, you know, I'll tell you who's an old soul. And I now I'm remembering who I said that about. That was about, um, oh, uh, the little girl in Poltergeist. Yes. Name, you know who I'm talking about? Yes. She was an old soul and I'm telling you she's a little girl and she loved Barbies and she loved all of this and she was great with her mom she wasn't like a little actressy thing she was just a real little girl however that set of poltergeistry was so difficult such a difficult shoot and such long days and whenever god what was her name anyway whenever she was there right. she'd come on the set and I'd go Oh, you could feel she had such a grounding energy. You'd feel the sense of safety. So I had that feeling. It's like she really was an old soul. Someone you would think some, you know, old, wise, you know, 90-year-old person would have that kind of, you know, comforting presence about them. Right. But she had it, you know, she did. Heather, that, Heather Michelle. Heather O'Rourke. Heather O'Rourke, yes. And incredible little girl really incredible and she was she wasn't sick it wasn't she wasn't sick a lot of people think she was sick on that and that's why she died afterwards that's not what was wrong she was on she was a little puffed up she was on steroids for something she had had wrong with her uh prior to the shoot so she was a little full in her face yeah but um I just oh, I just I just loved her really uh, 
the and it's again another a, a piece of work that you did which reached so many people um of course with a poltergeist family well the trilogy yes the, the trilogy <laughs> and talking I, about a trilogy what about robocop i love it <laughs> this is well you know who knew you know they didn't even know the studio didn't even know they spent 50 cents on the first one if i tell you the budget was i think I think the budget was $12 million for that film. That's it. Really? We got paid very little. I mean, very, very little. But we didn't care because when I remember reading that script. I got the script in the mail yeah. or delivery. It was, you know, then they just had a messenger service. And I opened it up and it said Robocop. And I called my agent. I said, well, they're changing this title, right? This is terrible. He said, oh, I'm sure they'll change that title. That's awful. I said, oh, good. I said, well, I don't have much time, but I'll read it. I'll read a little bit and I'll catch up with it later. I opened that script, page one, page two. I couldn't put it down. It was riveting. I had never read anything like it. And it was just compelled to make this film. I thought, I don't care. I don't care what they pay me. I don't care anything. I just have to do this and I have to play this role. My father's a cop. I really feel I get this. And I just thought it was a really smart, very smart script. Um, as a film, it works on many levels, as you know. I mean, it's just pure entertainment, but it's also it's also um, just a really unique film. And um, Well, it's interesting, too, how you said your father was a cop. And it's interesting how we bring things into our lives that way. Oh, oh yeah you know yeah for sure yeah I you know definitely I mean I remember you know what it was like growing up and him my mother not knowing you know when he'd be back and if something was going on and how he felt about his partner and all of that oh look who's there <laughs> <laughs> I remember her <laughs> I remember her um, oh my goodness <laughs> well let's bring I see Bill James Bill James your 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 thumb is up so I'm gonna bring you on to ask a question here all right hi Bill I have seen Robocop I really liked when you played the cop one of the cops oh. you you were amazing thank that was you programs Movies. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you like it. I think it's uh, I think it's pretty good too. It's very good. It made me happy. Yes. Did you find it uh, entertaining? Did you that exciting? Yes, and... I did. Yeah. You you are an amazing actress. Oh, uh, thank you. I'll tell You're you, all the bad guys were the nicest people. <laughs> all of them. They didn't drink. <laughs> They didn't smoke. They didn't curse. I mean, they were just so nice. And then you talk about how do you play that kind of character is a perfect example. I even did a drawing too. Ooh, what's I the drawing? I think you have to hold it back a little bit. Yeah, hold it back a little. It's blurry a little. And up a little higher, maybe. Let's see. It's. I think. I it's, see it. Let's see. Go, get a little closer now. Maybe it's because of that. Uh, oh. I see it's sort of like ghost-like because of the, the background. Yeah, what is it? Him. That's a robot. Oh. I, I'm an artist on the side myself. Oh, that's great. I draw every day. It makes me happy. Oh, well, that's so wonderful. I think that's and a I great outlet. To, and I go to a special camp called Xena Mountain Farms in Vermont. It must be beautiful. It is. They're great, and they do these wonderful films there. And uh, and and you know the disability film challenges, the annual one. They're ten year, uh, re ten years they've been together now. So they're we're putting together films over throughout the whole world. And so maybe Bill, you'll jump into one of those this year. Yeah, maybe I will. Wow, maybe. that's really exciting. Good luck with that, Bill. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You, Bill. Let's see. let's see. You know, I know he always says, hey, give me a call and let's see if he's still on. Uh, Mr. T-Bone Williams, Antonio Williams. Hello, how are you doing? Hey. <laughs> hey. Hi. Hi, Antonio. I have a question for you. Where, where, where 
what 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 is your favorite what is your favorite place to go and fly? Where's my favorite place to go when? Where is your favorite place to go and why? Oh, my favorite place to go and why? Well, Antonio, I happen to like Hawaii because I like the warm water mm. and I like to snorkel and see fish and just be comfortable and do almost nothing. <laughs> That's yeah. my favorite place. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, how often do, do you get... Uh, how often do you get to see your family if you work so much? How often do I see who? Your family. How often do you get to see your family since you work so much? Oh, my family. Well, um, so currently I have a nephew and he lives in New York and we see each other once a year, but we talk on the phone frequently. I have a um, boyfriend, we've been together for eight years. We live together and we see each other every day. Um, I'm not working as much in the movie business these days. For the last 20 years, I've worked in uh, cancer support. I work with cancer patients and that's kind of my, my mission right now. So um, my, life, my life's on a mostly regular schedule. So, but I do, I think it's, your question is important, Antonio, because I think that uh, to make time for family and friends is what's really important, really important and, in life. And, and, do, and, and do you, and do you, do you have a, do, do you think it's a real hard situation because, because of the COVID to work? So what do we do in terms of co? What have I done in terms of COVID with work? It's hard for you to buy work because of COVID. Well, you know, um, let's put it this way. During COVID, I was working in the arena of cancer support. And we, just like this, all of the support groups, all of the work, everything was being done virtually. But um, COVID... I actually, in 2020, um, September of COVID, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. I was very fortunate because it was early stage. So I was very busy for the next period of time with doctor's appointments and surgery and all different kinds of things like that. So I think the greatest challenge for most of us, if not all of us, was not being connected and seeing people in person, having to go on to Zoom, which is great that we have it, but it's not the same as giving someone a hug or, you know, having lunch with them or meeting somebody for dinner, having someone visit. So um, I think, you know, I'm a homebody by nature. So it's like, ah, stay home. What's the problem? But the fact is, is that you do need to get out and connect. So I think it was a big challenge. And I know a lot of people who were working in entertainment, and that was very challenging. The co the uh, all of the protocols were very difficult. So, um, yeah. So that's what I was doing in COVID. Thank you, Antonio T Bone Williams. Thank you. Um, you know, in regards to that, one thing uh, that another way that you heal is that. My, my aunt had passed away from cancer. And uh, after that, I, I was in a mental upshake and I looked around and I saw WeSpark. And I had heard from you from several friends um, uh, who, about WeSpark. So I, I, I came in one day and you, I sat down and there you were and you, through that short little visit, helped guide me to a, a healing place. Also, in the last year during COVID, a dear friend of uh, a lot of ours, Ati Angel, who was a beautiful, one of the, uh, to me, she was the dancer. She happened to be, a, um, uh, uh, she used a wheelchair, um, paraplegic, but she danced in her wheelchair and she had wow. so much joy and love and she was an actress and a, a, a singer 
And at age 52, she made her transition from breast cancer. What, oh. what guided you, what I'm getting here too is how do you, if somebody's dealing with, let's say personally for me at this time, somebody who is sick um, and, and how would you say to get help if they're reaching out for help, if they know somebody who's sick or even if they're sick? Well, I mean, <laughs> the main thing is to reach out. And a lot of us as humans think, well, I, I'll handle it. I can take care of it. I don't really need that. I know, but you know, there's a, a lot of power in connection because it's all about connections. Like whether you're acting, you have to connect with your partner or you're writing, whatever you're doing. And in our feelings, our feelings as humans is what makes us all connected on some level. So if I have, if I'm sick and I talk to somebody else that's sick, I can say, oh, I'm going through this and I felt that and they go, oh yeah, I get it. I get it, me too. Or I went through that. It's different than talking to someone or if in grief, yeah. how many times have someone said, oh, I just lost someone and someone will say to you, oh, oh, I, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, they're in a better place. Well, wait a minute. Hello, stop. I'm not in a good place because I just <laughs> lost somebody. You know what I mean? So it's, it's validating. It's very validating to have someone else to share with, to talk to, who says, I understand. I hear you, you know, who's willing to listen. And um, I think we all learn from each other. You know, we really do. And especially in challenging times, you know, we all share the good. We want to celebrate with our friends and do all the fun stuff. But it's in the tough times when I think I've learned uh, in my life that um, I used to be, I was raised to be able to handle things by myself, that I didn't need anyone. My father always said, I don't need anybody else. I just need me. And, and it, it's very isolating. It's very isolating. And it's really hard. Sometimes it is too hard to go through things by ourselves. And why should we? Yeah. What do we what do we prove by doing that? But if we open ourselves up, which we have to do as a creative person, we have to open ourselves up. We have to be vulnerable and put ourselves out. And we actually, when we open up and say, you know, I could use a little help. I could use a little support. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling whatever I'm feeling. And someone's there for us. I mean, that's just, it's incredible, you know, to not have to go through things alone. And, and also, you give the other person the opportunity, you know, we love to be of service to one another and to say we've helped someone. So it's really, it works both ways. It's a benefit to the person who needs the support, and it's the benefit to the person who's doing the supporting. It's just a really, you know, symbiotic uh, way of doing things. So I would say, why go through it alone, you know, if you can have support? What guided, what guided you to, to go that way in your journey? to be such a support for others? Well, I think, you know, I've had, um, I've had a lot of loss in my life. Um, I've had some, you know, personal tragedies. I went through a really, uh, we'll call it a dark night of the soul myself at some point in my life when I was in my mid thirties where I just was going down like the Titanic really. And a very dear friend of mine, in fact, it was my first boyfriend in high school, is the one who reached out to me and um, gave me the support that I needed and helped helped me kind of rebuild everything in my life. And and um, having had so much loss, losing my father, then losing both of my brothers, like seven months apart. I mean, just out of nowhere. And um, you know. tell you what it feels great to have success in your life but I really think the greatest secret for me in my life the greatest secret of life is the more you give the better you feel not this we're all like oh I need this I want that I want success I want and you know I've had all that that's not it it's never it you think it's it but you get it and you go, well, that's good, but it's not it. Because the it is, how do you feel the inside? How do you feel your heart and your soul? And it's by 
it's by giving to others, it's helping others. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, being at WeSpark, there's nothing that makes me feel better than someone saying, oh, thank you for listening. That really helped, really helped me. I'm thinking, I didn't do anything. I just sat there and I listened. I did nothing. But you know, that kind of giving, and I know when people have done it for me, it's like you do it for fun and for free, you know? And um, so I, um, I don't know. I don't know if that answers. No, <laughs> I did. It, it, it does. And it brought up, I used to study with Corey Allen. Um, and oh, yeah? And he, I was his assistant for five years. He was like the grandfather I had never met. And I found out later we had the same last, we, we had the same name in his real name. But um, he would always, I, I used to give, do this, give, 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 but I wouldn't replenish myself. But then I learned through that. And when you were talking about it, I felt that movement by giving you receive. Um, you do. And, and, and it, you can translate that to not in your own life, but it's the same in a creative world. Because I can think about some of the people that I've worked with who are so generous as actors. You know, they give you so much. They're there for you. They ho hold that space for you. So our job then to be on the other side of it is to receive it and not go, oh, no, no, no. I remember being in an in a <laughs> audition uh, and um, I had the part, and so I was reading with the other actors, and there was an actor, was a very famous actor that came in who really, 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 really wanted this part, yeah. and um, he had flown himself in, and, you know, uh, we met, and it was on a Sunday, and he came in, and he started to act the scene, right. and the director said, no, 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 let me just, I, what I'm looking, he said, and the actor went, no, 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 I know what you want, he just <laughs> talked to him. and then he did it again, and he said, then, the director said, well, let me just, he said, no, I, no, I, now I, I really think I know what you want. So it's like, stop. And I, I sat there and I thought, oh my God, how many times have I done that? I guess I probably have done that. <laughs> it's like, you have to, you're so out of body sometimes when you're auditioning for something, you know, right. <laughs> you have to listen. If someone's going to give you direction, listen to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so much about the listening. Yes. The listening. So is, do you have the desire to jump back into acting or are you <laughs> enjoying and um, thriving on what you are doing at this moment? Well, I, I, this is the only moment I have. So I am thriving and enjoying this moment because who knows what's next. But, um, you know, I was saying, you know, I'm done, I'm not acting, but, but, you know, I know I've learned to never say never because you never know what's going to happen. And, right. uh, I've had a few things that have popped up recently. So I think it would be the right circumstances, the right role, the right situation, the, excuse me, the director, the circumstances would have to draw me in. Yeah. I'm not actively pursuing it, right. but I do have someone who kind of looks through stuff, things that people who contact me who are interested in certain things. So yeah, it would have to be something special because you know what? It's a, it's hard work, number one. And I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't want to shoot nights. I'm too tired. I wouldn't <laughs> want to. It's like, I want to start listing all the things. Well, I don't want to really go on location. Well, I don't, you know, it's like you really kind of limit it yeah. <laughs> to yeah. something. But I never say never to anything. You know, you never know. Well, uh, a couple of things that you mentioned before, too, um, is about about friendships. And I know that I, I have several friends who kept on saying, oh, Nancy Allen, Nancy Allen, um, like Sissy Wellman, and, oh. <laughs> and, and who I'm dear friends with who um, uh, we went to Born to Act Players together uh, uh, and Sherry Lewis Beachfront. Oh, uh, I well, know. Both of those women. <laughs> a joy and Melissa Scoff, you know, I, she told yeah. me to go. So all these, I've heard about you for years. And, and, um, and then I came to one of your events uh, that you had at the Catalina Jazz Club for- Oh, Spark. that was fun, right? Oh, it was so great. And you have events every year for We Spark. We do, we do a comedy show because I think people need to laugh. We yes. do that once a year, that's our main event. Uh, we, Jason Alexander, I talk about a generous, wonderful human being, he hosts a, poker tournament for us and that's coming up in March. We do um, a run walk and um, very few people are running and people are walking very 
carefully, <laughs> but we do that every year. We just had that and it was extremely successful. And uh, we haven't done the jazz in a while because of COVID. So maybe, who knows, maybe next year we'll do it. But yeah, it's, we had a lot of fun, you know, yeah. I, we in, and we do a drag queen bingo. Oh, yes, I saw that. I, went Bingo on boy. <laughs> I saw that it was June it sold out but I said oh that was from last year yeah 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 we'll do it again probably this year I'll let you know okay that'd be great <laughs> um you, one other thing you brought up and I I'm I'm coming back to it is that you said during COVID you found out that you had were dealing with cancer yeah. um wh- how how from being on one side of it uh, and helping others, how do you help yourself? Well, first of all, you know, I was in shock because I was having a bone density and a mammogram. And my friend said to me, good luck with the mammogram. I said, oh, please, that's nothing. I was concerned at my age about the bone density test. And so when, and I was about, I was a little late with my mammogram. So I would tell everybody, please, I know we don't like them, but you have to get your mammograms. And they, I have dense breasts, which is about 70% of women do, which means you can't really see in a normal mammogram if there's any cancer there because the cancer is the same, it's like the same color as the the breast tissue. So I always know they're going to do the other test and all of that. And then I wasn't paying much attention, but they said needle biopsy. And I went, oh, okay, that's probably a cyst. I mean, it just was not comprehending this. Yeah. I'm too old. And then when they, the doctor said, well, let's mar- mark this for surgery. And I, that's when I kind of came out of my reverie going mark it for surgery. I was stunned. And I, I did. I talked to the doctor. I said, you know, I know too much. You got to tell me the truth. And he said, it's something. It's definitely something. It's not nothing. So, um, Uh, after I was in complete shock when I hear it's like the next day I had to wait overnight for the pathology of the tumor and um when they called they said yes it's it's you know it's cancer or they used another word which is even worse it was like a horrible word whatever it was some sort of you know doctor word that they use and um but you know what even though it was in COVID, I happened to be at the office that day and with the two other of the, the two of the executives that were there. Yeah. And I just fell apart. I just completely fell apart. And I heard what we do. It's like, we're here for you. I contacted one of the therapists who would normally, you know, talk to somebody who's newly diagnosed. And I downloaded my feelings with her. And I used, I believe much, very much in the, the mind body connection. This is the piece we have to work with. Yeah. in so many ways. And I, um, everyone kept saying, be positive. I'm thinking, be positive. <laughs> How do I do that? You know what I mean? Be yeah. positive. I'm in terror, even though I should have known that they kept saying, no, this tumor. It's... Anyway, I used hypnotherapy and um, with the suggestion of positivity. And I guess it worked because when I got to the hospital for my surgery, People kept looking at me, you know, they looked very concerned. How are you? And I went, I feel great. I feel very positive. And they're kind of look at me like, was she taking drugs this morning? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I went through the surgery. Everything was great. But I opened myself up to, I had friends that said, hey, let us, we'll bring food. Don't worry about, you know, food. They brought over and dropped food off. And everyone showed up. And I guess... The fact that I had spent so much of my life, so much at that point of my adult life, being open to uh, supporting others and letting people support me and open myself up and not, you know, try to go through things alone. It really, um, it made it, it made it quite easy. And I was one of the lucky ones. I had a very good diagnosis. Once they removed the tumor, uh, it was done. I didn't have to do chemo. I didn't have to do radiation. I am on medicine for five years. I do have to take certain medicine for five years. But, um, you know, I was kind of trained to do all the work that I had done. And it was kind of like, wait a minute, I've been doing this for 19 years. It's not possible. How am I getting this? How come I'm the cancer patient now? But, uh, you know, it was, I was lucky because I knew from all the women over the years and the men that have come in and listened to them, 
you know, I had some experience, their experience to draw on and uh, looking at food. What am I eating? What am I putting in my body? So I made a lot of changes after that. So, yeah. but uh, yeah. It really is, you know, and thank you for that reminder about power of the mind. It's that little shift because, and this, this you could deal with. I mean, uh, I've had troubles like I stress out sometimes when I do act in the past it's like the lines do I have the lines and I like instead of going breathe going into it (laughs) and then there was a time when I I was turning 50 and I was going to have a big party at the Catalina Jazz Club and a week before I had a massive heart attack I know at 49 and I was going oh my god I went to one hospital and they said, oh, you're fine. They sent me home after three hours. Later that night, I was feeling worse. So we went to Cedars and 11 doctors come in after this test. They said, Mr. Zimmerman, you've had a heart attack today. And I was like, oh and my it was God. insane. And not wood, <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I ma- made it through and it took you know time to get through. But it's interesting about, as, as I go back to what you said, the power of the mind um eating healthy exercising and the connection that that Mm -hmm. you that that you need whether it's a friend or whether it's we spark or whether it's um and you have you could see by some of the the people who just wanted to talk to you you have this loving giving energy that they'll just start talking to you about i have a problem can you (laughs) my whole life (laughs) why <laughs> people tell me their secrets I'm fine with that you know I'm a good secret keeper but <laughs> yeah you know it's uh I'm sorry you had to go through that but I bet it was transformative in a lot of ways for you you know it was it was it uh, I'm not as scared of life anymore as much I still get scared <laughs> once in a while mm-hmm. of certain things especially this day and age but um but that being said some of the things that I were th- that I thought oh we're so big are not as big anymore and I have more of a focus mm-hmm. it and gives I also- you perspective it gives you perspective yeah right? yeah it does it gives you perspective and it also makes you appreciate this moment makes yeah. you- and the people who you're with yeah also uh, like you like you said too about it's not just the acting acting isn't just the life it's 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 the friendships it's helping others it's yeah 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 I mean going to the set to do whatever job I was doing to play whatever role was the work part of it but then there was the component I loved I remember that sound stage and all those people and thinking all these people who don't necessarily know each other they're coming together could be a hundred people and they're working together and they're all working together, yeah, yeah. you know, for the same common goal. That's a great, a really great thing. It's just, you, you get to know, I always tried to get to know, oh, there's, you know, Mike, he's on the, you know, he's the dolly grip or, you know, whoever's doing whatever job they're doing. And, and um, you know, because you're all in this together, you know, yeah. and I just want to say, and the last thing about what you were talking about, I would say that the biggest upheavals, the biggest loss, whether it was a loss or what I seemed, it seemed to be a disaster in my life, ultimately were such gifts because I learned so many lessons from them, so many life lessons. And um, so I think that those challenges are, you know, even though they're hard, they're definitely, it's a gift for advancing you forward in your life in terms of being a human being, you know, one thing that Corey Allen would always bring up in, in his classes uh, at the beginning of the class, and then we would use it throughout the class and throughout our lives. And the question was, what do you want the most at this moment in your life? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me get my list out. <laughs> You know, I, uh, I, it's pretty, pretty simple what I want at the most this, at this moment in my life. I want to stay healthy and I want to probably 
make more time for my friends and you know the, that connection. And I really want for nothing. I realize a simple life for me is the best life. So I think about what do you want? I don't really want anything. I want to stay healthy and I want to stay happy and connected to my friends and and um, you know just say here we are here we are together here today and isn't this fun and let's see what's next you know be open to the possibilities you know be open to the surprises instead of going oh my god what's going to happen next you know what I, mean? I always wanted the map through the minefield prepare for this prepare for that it's like you know what it'll be okay <laughs> thank you nancy allen thank you oh david thank you for having me and i really Really appreciate being here today and appreciate being here with all of you today and wish you all a beautiful rest of your day and uh, may your dreams come true. Uh, well, thank and you. even the ones you haven't thought of yet. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Everybody, we're going we're gonna to just do a little group, uh, 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 group shot here with Nancy and we'll, uh, on the count of three, we'll just say Nancy. And uh, here we go. One, two, three, Nancy. Mwah. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Big kiss. Mwah.